Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be doing three mini reviews of vintage Mead telescopes. Two of them are refractors, the model number 312 80mm f11 Acromat and its sister model in brass, the number 314. The third one is this Mead MTS SN6 Schmidt Newtonian reflector on a fork mount, one of the rarest and most unusual telescopes Mead has ever sold. At the end of this review, I'll tell you if I think any of these are worth collecting. Let's take a look. So you know, back in the mid-1980s, up through around the early 1990s, refractors weren't what they are today. They just didn't see them around a lot. It's different today, of course. Everybody seems to want a nice refractor. Back then, not quite so much. Credit Mead for keeping the spirit of the refractor alive. Usually these things were in the back of the catalog and there were like two models they had. One was usually a 60 millimeter and the other was an 80 millimeter. And people usually didn't buy them because they were pretty expensive and you could get a lot more bang for your buck by buying one of their reflectors. Now the Mead model system usually contained three digits. The 200 series were usually 60 millimeter refractors and the 80 millimeters were usually, but not always, 80 millimeter refractors. There were many of them in this period, so many I can't even keep touch. Model 300, Model 310, Model 312, 314, 323, and many more. And again, these existed during a time when refractors were relatively rare. It wasn't like today when everybody's sourcing things out of China. These came from Japan, from respected manufacturers such as Toa, Royal Astro, and Carton. That's good. And in fact, collectors today know to seek these things out because of their quality. And because they were made in Japan, and because they weren't sold in large numbers, prices were high. Take a look at this catalog cut I got from my 1992 Mead catalog. Look at this, the model number 312, the blue one in the, with a steel tube, over $900. And the brass one at the bottom there, take a look at that, over $1,700. Those are $1,992, folks. Depending on how you calculate things, the consumer price index from 1992 to today is over two to one. In today's dollars, these things could be two to four thousand dollars, and they're acromats. So what we have here, fairly typical designs of the period, 80 millimeter F11 acromats, their doublets, magnesium fluoride coatings on the lenses, nice touch here, collimatable lens cells on an alt as mount. Those cables I've always found annoying. On this one, you'll see the user has substituted radio knobs. I like that a lot better. Look for condition issues. The tray and the spreader bars are missing on this one. That happens so much, it's almost a cliche. Now, given that these things were so expensive back in the day, they're relatively cheap today, and flea markets are good places to find these things. These are both flea market finds, and I don't even want to tell you what they went for. It was almost next to nothing. Sad to think that at some point, someone at the beginning of the life of this telescope paid those prices. We got six by 30 finders. You have a rack and pinion focuser inch and a quarter only on the visual back and the ubiquitous little set screw that doesn't hold things very tightly. Be careful putting your expensive accessories back there lest that screw decides to let go. Have a cheap diagonal. And again, the very common Mead number MA25 eyepiece. If you collect old telescopes, you probably have a drawer full of those things hanging around. So again, these are actually the same telescope, except one of them is in brass. And I don't know how much of this is coming across on video, but that brass tube is stunning. It is beautiful. People who have come in here while I've been doing this go right to that telescope and they want to touch it. And wow, that just looks terrific. A nice touch is all of the accessories up to and including the collimation screws on the lens cell are also brass. Now the tube does weigh quite a bit more. The steel one weighs about six and a half pounds. The brass one weighs close to nine pounds. You know, these Altaz mounts, I think they fall under the category of good for their day, but today I think we expect something a little bit better. So I used them for a while, got a little tired of it and put the tube ring on a Vixen compatible plate and put it on my AVX mount, have the full benefit of tracking and go to. How are the optics? Well, the blue one is actually pretty good. Star test, nothing much to talk about. The brass one, and I'm not really sure what's going on here, 
it's not a good telescope. The optics are pretty bad. In fact, the star test is actually much worse than the half-wave diagrams in Souter's book. He only goes up to half-wave. I think this is significantly worse, two times worse, or even more than that. So we're looking at about a one-wave error on that brass telescope. Now, people have asked me, what does that mean? Like, how does that translate into actual observing? Can you see that? Well, I'll tell you what I saw. I went observing before I did the star test. I always like to do that because I don't want to be influenced by any of that. And here's what I saw. On the double star Mizar and Alcor in the Big Dipper, these are not difficult doubles to split, by the way, I found that I had trouble drawing a really sharp focus on it. It would sort of go in and out, and I was making excuses for myself, like saying it was the seeing or something like that. But when I put the blue telescope on it, it was fine. It snapped right into focus. You may also think, well, what does it do on imaging? So I did try with my webcam planetary imager on the moon. And though this is not a scientific test, by the way, consider this just a snapshot in time. But I did take images of the moon minutes apart using the same settings and duplicating the same keystrokes in SharpCap, AutoStackert, Registax, and Photoshop. So here they are side by side, brass and blue, and that's the magnification you're probably going to see things at. I'm not seeing any difference there. Let's look at it at 100%. Can you see a difference there? Well, at 100%, maybe just a little bit. Let's blow it up again. If you wanted to look at it at 200%, which you're never going to do, by the way, this is what it looks like. And yes, I think I can see that the blue one is slightly better. But again, at a regular magnification where most people are going to be looking at these images, I don't think you can see any difference at all. Again, this is not a scientific test. I've been doing this for a long time, and I know that atmospheric conditions can change even by the second. So let's just call this an interesting experiment. Other than that, I didn't really notice anything here from my Bortle four and a half or so skies here. M81 and M82 were not a problem to find. M65, M66, and NGC 3628, a little bit more challenging with the light pollution encroaching. Is there false color? Yes, there is. On the limb of the moon, you can see it. False color is just something you deal with in an acromat. I started to notice the false color on stars brighter than, say, Regulus or so. Okay, on to the Schmidt Newtonian. If you're not familiar with the design, a Schmidt Newtonian on the surface does resemble a conventional Newtonian reflector. The only difference is that there is a Schmidt corrector plate on the front, similar to what you see on a Schmidt Cassegrain. And the purpose of the corrector plate is to correct for aberrations at the edges, almost inevitable in any fast Newtonian. Schmidt Newtonians tend to be very fast. Done correctly, the edge aberrations on a Schmidt Newtonian could be as much as one-fourth that of a pure conventional Newtonian reflector. That's in theory, anyway. In practice, things are a little bit different. Schmidt Newtonians have gotten a bad rap because of poor execution, cheap materials, and the fact that they haven't really made a lot of these economies of scale have never taken over. Throughout Mead's history, they've tried at least two times to introduce the Schmidt Newtonian into the general public. One of them was this one back in the mid-1980s on this mount here. The second one was in the early 2000s on LXD-55 and LXD-75 mounts. Unfortunately for that second iteration, the LXD-55-75 duo were some of the worst equatorial mounts ever made, unfortunately tarnishing the reputation of the optical tubes, perhaps unfairly, that rode atop them. To this date, Mead has never tried this again. Now, the Schmidt Newtonian has fallen out of favor lately. You don't really see this a lot. What people tend to do today to correct for edge aberrations on fast Newtonians is they'll get one of these things. This is a coma corrector. You find these around, I think this one says Apertura on it. I think I paid about $150 for it. If you have money, you want to go for it, go ahead and get the Teleview Paracore. Just don't look at the price. So the part number here is MTS SN6. SN6, of course, stands for Schmidt Newtonian. MTS was Mead's abbreviation for Modular Telescope System, 
and you got to leave it to Mead's marketing department. They did a great job here. The only thing really modular about any of this is the fact that they were going to make you pay for the accessories that they should have included to begin with. The only thing modular was the money involved here. For example, this is the base model. It does not have the motor drive. There would be a module down here that would drive the scope. Also, the corrector plate on the base version is not coded. You'd have to pay for this. The reflections off this thing are incredibly bright. The <laughs> scope wizard and I had this thing apart, and we're looking at this thing from all angles. I don't think that there's any coatings on this thing at all. I can't imagine what the light loss is through this thing. And despite the fact that this is modular, there is no option for replacing the helical focuser. That's right, two-inch helical focuser. The quality is okay, I guess, but it's a puzzling decision at this price point. $599 in mid-1986 dollars. Now, if you wanted to, I have seen people retrofit moonlight focusers on here. If you do that, just be aware. If you decide to go in through the front of the scope, you're going to have to take the Schmidt corrector plate off. When you put it back on, you could have collimation issues. Collimating a Schmidt Newtonian can be an issue. I'll leave a link in the description below as to how to properly do this. Now, you can collimate a Schmidt Newtonian like a regular Newtonian. In fact, that's how I do it. It gets you close enough. But if you're a perfectionist, you have to go through those extra steps to get it perfectly in line. If you do decide to replace the focuser and go out through the back, keep in mind you're going to be reaching further in, and there's always the danger of touching the corrector plate or the secondary in the front. Things to watch out for. So again, leave it to Mead. The fact that this thing is a Schmidt Newtonian is not the most interesting part of this telescope. No, that honor goes to this weird fork mounted system that I, 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 they've never tried this before or since. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, Schmidt Cassegrains are on these fork mounts all the time. And in fact, this does appear just to be a repurposed fork mount from the early LX3, LX5, LX6, that era fork mount. But if you think about it on a Schmidt Cassegrain, those are almost always driven. And not only are they driven, there are usually a slow motion control here so that you can track what's going on. Here, you got nothing. In order to track the stars, you've got to grab this and move it this way. Now, I don't know if this is coming through, but this feels incredibly awkward when you're out there doing this and have to you know, turn this. And the fact that the base model doesn't have the motor drive on it just makes this worse. How do the images look? Well, I happen to have at least two other 6-inch F5 telescopes here. One of them is contemporary with this telescope. That's the Mead model number 645 that you saw me review earlier. The problem with that telescope, if you recall, is that the 30 to 35-year-old mirrors on it have started to deteriorate and the images have gotten dimmer. The other one I have is the Celestron Omni 150 that you saw me review, 6-inch F5, and it's got the new Celestron Starbright XLT coatings on it. That image, of course, was a lot brighter than both of these. As far as the figure on the mirror goes, I think they're all pretty good. They're close enough that I don't think there's any difference. But in terms of the brightness of the images, there is a big difference. This one is even dimmer than the model number 645. I mean, we were looking at this, and the one remark that just kept coming back is the images looked awfully dim. I had this out against this Takahashi FC100 that you're seeing almost out of the frame here. That's a four inch, and I was looking at both the double cluster and M81 and M82, and the images were about the same brightness. So again, this telescope, it's weird, it's awkward, I think it's ugly. There wasn't any one thing that did it in for me here. Rather, it was a combination of a lot of different factors. The lack of the motor drive, the lack of the coatings on the Schmidt corrector plate, and a helical focuser. You take all that stuff together, and it just mount mounted to an experience that I didn't find all that pleasant. The more I used this, the more I started to kind of look back at the refractors, wishing I was using one of those. Okay, should you buy one of these if you run across them? The refractors, I'm going to say yes. You're getting Japanese quality, and collectors are actually starting to seek these things out. In addition, prices are very good. I don't know what to tell you about that brass one. I've never seen one of these look that bad. I'm going to chalk this one up as a stray data point. Also, look for missing parts. Those tripod spreader bars and the accessory tray go missing a lot. 
Also, I'm finding flea markets and yard sales are better than places like Craigslist or eBay, where people tend to ask too much money. As for the Schmidt Newtonian, I'm going to say no. Again, it's weird, it's ugly. Some of this is personal preference, but I'll tell you, whenever I get a new telescope in here, in my mind, at least for a short time, I think to myself, what should I buy that? Or maybe I should get one of those. This thing here, I never once had that feeling. But again, if your tastes run towards the weird and unusual and you're a collector, don't let me stop you. So there you have it, a look at three vintage Mead telescopes from the mid-1980s to early 1990s. If you run across one of these things, I hope this video has helped you to decide if you want to pick one up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.